So I'll start by introducing myself a little bit. So I'm Christian Goudreau. I'm from ArcBees. Uh, I'm the BEO. Uh, if you want to know what it is, just ask me. <laughs> um, so I founded this business uh, five years ago, and uh, we've been working. I, I've been one of the first contributors to UTP with my co-founder, Philip. And uh, before starting with every single best practice kind of uh, that we came uh, that that I have to that I want to to, to share with you to, today I want to talk a little bit about, about what Julian said because when he said community actors I think he was referring to kind of the steering committee members uh, and kind of art piece and uh, we were talking a little bit about the future yesterday night uh, with uh, some of the speakers and one thing for sure uh, to me is that what they're doing right now rewriting the whole compiler is the right thing to do, and it's the first step toward the future. So they are focusing on that, and if they had to share the resource on every single feature that GWT has, it will never end. So they have to start somewhere, right? So let's start with my uh, session. So the motivation, uh, the, the motivations that we have behind the best practice I want to share is that first thing, um, well, have better structure application. And the second thing, make sure that every single thing that you have uh, to share with your coworkers are done efficiently. So the first one, I think it's obvious after the talk that Julian, uh, that Julian did that avoiding widget as much as possible. But I have other reason to, do, to, to say that. And, uh, we, uh, we were always advocating, advocating this uh, best practice since the early beginning. It's because it's create too much dumb element. They are heavy and create some things like this. So even when you're using a simple panel, for example, to include a new widget inside it, it creates a div element that is not necessary. I'll go really fast on the example we made this presentation with a lot of stuff so, if, uh, so that you can able to read it afterward and keep it as reference. So don't hesitate to download it after the presentation. Um, this is a good example of adding too much widgets inside your uh, UI binder files. And you should use as much as possible plain HTML rather than widgets and CSS as well. And uh, one of the things that Good widgets, in, uh, Good widget introduced that is not really needed uh, when it comes to uh, handling everything that is happening onto your web page is that it, it, it introduce uh, not only a physical event mechanisms but but also a logical. So you have a full event mechanisms that is on top of what already exists into the browser, even if you don't need it. So how to attach event handler to the elements itself? Um, back in the uh, before JS interrupt, we would have, uh, I would have said jQuery and the, a jQuery, and this is still what I have in my presentation. But I think that with GWT 2.8, you would be able to move away from this rewrite, uh, this full rewrite of G, uh, jQuery into pure Java and use directly jQuery itself. So when to use widget? When is it all right to use widget? And uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that I advocate to use is the is widget uh, <coughs> interface rather than e extending a widget, a composite, or anything like this. Uh, try to avoid even to create uh, complex widgets. But uh, to encapsulate complex comp uh, components, it's still useful to extend the, the his widget interface and still use it. But keep in mind that try to keep your HTML as small as possible and use CSS, GSS, in fact, behind the scene to uh, manage your widget. Um, one thing we created when I said that simple panel, uh, panel when you're using it to include widgets inside your, uh, your pages or any other kind of panel, uh, by, it, it introduces um, a development that is not necessary. It can be a little bit awkward to, uh, to CSS uh, developers. Uh, so uh, we created a small replace panel. It's really a small piece of code that replaces a simple panel. And what it does is that it takes that 
unnecessary div and replace it by the, the by the widget that you have so it doesn't create that unnecessary div element anymore <laughs> and you do all the logical binding that it's needed behind the scene that uh, that GUID, that GUID uh, introduced. The second ba best practice is embrace user history. Um, it's really important to start from, uh, uh, from the beginning of when you design your web application with GUID to embrace the history, to use it efficiently, and try to make sure that your back forward refresh button work as expected. That's what a, uh, a user expect nowadays. I think it's really straightforward. Uh, five years ago, this wasn't really straightforward. Uh, most of web application that was built on GUID back and forward button didn't work, not even refresh. But uh, I, I, I'll say it again because I, we still end up with clients where their application, you hit refresh, it doesn't work, or you click on back and forward, it doesn't work. So make sure that you design right from the beginning and think about how to introduce back and forward and refresh by keeping the state of every single page you have. Another uh, one of the best practices that we advocate is the use of Nevenbus. Um, that's also something that uh, wasn't really straightforward five years ago, but now it is. Uh, most of GUID application use uh, an event bus. Uh, even, you even have local event bus on each single widget. When we said that we have a full event system behind the, the GUID widget, there is even an event bus behind each single widget that you're adding into your web application. So try to use it efficiently. Not, don't, don't, don't use it too much. I mean, if you're, if you're throwing every single element on the uh, event bus, is, it is as bad as not using one at all. So try to find a balance between throwing an, an event that is, is meant to be accessible by the whole app versus an event that is meant to be accessible by a single element or part of your application. So one of the main reasons to do that is uh, to fight fa spaghetti decode and make sure that everything is decoupled. And um, I'll spend to the next best practice, which is use the MVP pattern. Um, it has been advocated since years. Uh, we're still using heavily uh, this pattern in all kind of application. Most of them are really AV, um, a really big web application. Uh, into the, the insurance field, the healthcare field, or into the finance field. It's really great with GUID application because it's really fast to implement t a test driven development and to avoid testing the UI with the GUID test case. This with GUID 3.0, for example, uh, will not, well, will be uh, reduced. This, uh, the, the, the way that it's working and the way that it's faster. Uh, with with 3.0, you will now be able to use MVC or make a little bit more logic into the view without being too annoyed by the compile time. But uh, it, it's still a really great pattern when you use correctly and uh, will be for several years to come uh, in terms of uh, developing testable web application. So is there anyone that doesn't know about the MVP yet in the, in the room? the pattern. Everyone knows, so I skip this one. <laughs> and what we're using, obviously, to do the GUID, <laughs> the MVP pattern is GUIDTP. So uh, it has been developed right for this. Uh, we're working really hard right now uh, to, to, to be able to remove all the code generator uh, and work with an APT generator. There's also, uh, through the years, there's a, a, we've added quite a few components, so we're, uh, we're, we're starting to uh, simplify this uh, as well. And there will be a lot of change that uh, you will be able to see in the future. But uh, I'm not here to talk about GUTP, so I'll go fast over this. But GUTP and REST, and REST, REST practice is one of, and one of the design goal of uh, everything that we, at, that we do at, uh, at ArcBees, whatever, whatever open source uh, project that we, do, uh, that we create, is to, it's meant to give you um, what you need 
to be able to develop your application not only efficiently, but in a structured way. <coughs> so the other best practice is to use CSS as much as you can. Um, historically, the good community uh, regrouped a lot more developers than pure HTML, CSS uh, uh, developers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the first web application that, uh, that was being built, CSS was not quite used a lot. Uh, so embrace the fact that we're building web application and use CSS, well, GSS, as much as possible. Like I said, use GSS as much as possible. Keep your CSS clean. Um, that's another thing. Uh, we, as developers, we have a lot of best practice when it comes to write code. And what, when it comes to CSS, not a lot of people um, structure their CSS the same way that they code. They don't, they don't have the same best practice. And it is important, even when you write CSS, to make sure that, well, you remove unused code and that you have a code style prepared for the one that uh, writes it. It's for the same reason. When you build a really large web application, CSS tends to get messy once, uh, once it gets big. So try to uh, make sure that your team use the same code style for CSS as they would use for the code itself. The next one is about loading everything you can right from uh, right inside the HTML page when you, you uh, when you load your your, your application, mm -hmm. it, re it it reduces a little bit the speed, the initial loading time, what the user seems to see uh, a loading. So your initial uh, data can be injected right inside uh, your uh, HTML5 and then accessed through a, di a directory, and that way you avoid uh, a little bit of the loading, the initial loading time. Uh, one good example of that is when you have uh, team that are saved into the database. So uh, we, uh, when we build a team system, uh, we often just inject all the values that is needed by the, re uh, by the user to, to load the colors, to load the, uh, to load the styles right into the, the, the initial HTML5. That way uh, it appears to be uh, a lot faster to load in, this, uh, in the first uh, initial phase of your web application. Another one is a non-grown framework. What I meant by that is that when you're building a really, really big web application and that you have a lot of developers working as a team on your, on your web application, most of the time what we see is that people reuse styles uh, from the GSS file over and over the place. And when there's something to change, you then have to go everywhere into the web applications to update those styles. So uh, most of the time what, uh, wh what we try to do is encapsulate each, uh, each element as an atomic uh, substance of the application. I, I, have you ever heard of atomic design by, by Brad for, Frost, for example? Nope. Okay, so it's a really nice way of designing pa pages, not as pages, but as composite of elements. So basically what you build, it's small, uh, small elements, uh, like web components, for example, Polymer is a great example of that. And then you make it available to the, dev the other developers so that they can reuse it. So the style are applied only at one place, and then one, once every single developer uses it, it's applied seamlessly across the whole application. Um, <coughs> I really, uh, if you never heard about that to make design, I, re I really suggest you to read a little bit about it. It's, uh, uh, I, I, I left the, the, the website into the, into the slides for after the, the talk. So another best practice, this, is this one I think it's really obvious, is to build unit tests for everything that you're doing. <laughs> Um, when you're using dependency injection and the MVP pattern, it, it <coughs> makes that a lot easier. And true unit tests, we also have um, 
and other, uh, other best practices. Where, uh, as developers, we always use BDD to name uh, everything that is on our test. It makes it really easy afterward to, uh, to, to see which test is failing and why, and what it was testing afterward. So the way it's written, <coughs> so given the method, when what happens, then what will, uh, what, is, uh, what the, it is the ex expected result. And then you add that also into the blocks. Uh, we're using Jukito behind the scene. Uh, it has been st stable for several years. Uh, what this library do is basically, when using a, a dependency injection context, it uh, replaces all abstraction by Mox. So it's just a little bit easier and faster to write your unit test using that product. Um, This is one of my favorite, uh, favorite best practice because everyone n uh, agrees that code review is a good practice when it comes to uh, software development teams. But every time that we do training or that we uh, that we, uh, we we work with a business, they do that not consistently. So they do that maybe one on one on a Friday night or uh, when there's a really, really big feature uh, that needs, or a complex feature that needs to be reviewed. But code review is not only a way uh, to validate that what you have written has been written correctly, or that is structured the same way consistently across uh, your team. <laughs> it's also a really, really great practice to share knowledge. So basically when you're doing that, the knowledge of your best developer is transferred to the knowledge of your uh, less experienced developers. And your team is growing a lot faster by doing it. And to be able to do that, you need to do it consistently, several times a day. So at ArcBase, for example, we do that maybe, a developer can send basically three to four, maybe five code reviews a day, and is reviewed by the whole team after each time, each time. And by doing it uh, in a small, Piece, bits and pieces like this. Uh, it doesn't take the whole day to review, maybe 15 to 30 minutes a day that you do code review on top of your development practices. But the knowledge that you gain is really worth it. And when someone go on vacation after work, well, there's always someone else that knows exactly what's going on into that part of the, uh, the web application. <coughs> so, a couple of web-based code review system. Pretty sure that everyone here knows at least one. Or if it's not in the list, there's a lot more. So try to use one as much uh, when you get a chance. And some of the code review best practices, like I said, um, it's really important that the code review are as small as possible and that uh, those code review are really fast to read because if you make too much noises or in the sense that if your code review is too long basically people would just stop to read it, reading it for, 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 for a truly after war. So make it as small as possible. Even a 10 line code review is better than a 500 lines code review. Well another one, uh, auto format your code. Because one of the things that is really annoying when you do code review is to review line that has tabs versus lines that doesn't. And uh, someone that remove your spaces or that change the code that you have. So if everyone's write the code the same way, you want to end up with all those li uh, line changes that you don't need into what you need to review. Also address all comments before merging. It's really tempting. And I mean really, really, really tempting when you have release dates to just hit the merge and then forget about it. So try to fix all comments before doing that. And uh, even though there is a release date, it has to be clear and it has to be consistent because as soon as you agree to do a merge before everything is fixed, it will happen more and more often afterward. So you have to be consistent with that. Uh, continuous integration. 
So we were talking about code, code review, continuous integration. Your CI is your first code reviewer, basically. So whatever happens, if the build fail, it cannot be merged. Uh, if the test doesn't pass, it cannot be merged. And the first one to review your code, uh, to review your, 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 your pull requests, it needs to be your, your uh, CI. There's a lot of them. Uh, I'm pretty sure anyone, everyone knows one of them as well. And as you can see on, uh, on GitHub, for example, they have a really nice API that shows you exactly, okay, uh, this is building correctly, all test uh, uh, passes, and then if you want the detail of the build, you can ask, you can go to the, the, the CI environment to do it. Uh, we're using TeamCity um, to do it, and then we've built the, uh, several plugins to stash Bitbucket and GitHub for TeamCity so that they can uh, uh, push the, 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 build side, the build release, but not only that, TeamCity already supported this uh, the GitHub API, but we also publish uh, a, um, a version of the web application that is uh, look uh, that is um, that, that that only has the changes that adds into the pull request. So basically, we're using Docker in some, in some kind of environment. Others we don't need to do it to use Docker, but basically, each single PR has its own dev environment. And uh, when, when, when you, review, you review, you are really able to review the application in real time for each single PR that are open. Enforced check style is also really, import, really important. Let's come back a little bit. So through the build process, your CI doesn't, uh, doesn't review only, doesn't you know, it's not just about the build, it's not just about the test, it's also about the check style. Auto formatters are great, but doesn't do everything. So the check style enforce that if there's really something that is a, a, a missed, well, it will get, you will get a build error, basically, and with the exact line where uh, it didn't work. Uh, so we have check style on every single project that, uh, that we're uh, using to make sure that everyone does exactly what needs to be done. And the last one is about the development process. So all teams should work. And uh, when you have a small business, this is really hard to get because you, 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 you kind of do everything yourself. You're not only the developers, you're also, you're also the designer and the integrator. Uh, while those are three really distinctive uh, proficiency, so if you're uh, if you uh, if you have a bigger team, it's really uh, we we saw the changes at ArcBees, for example. We spent two years without a designer and without CSS and HTML expert, and the time the development cycle that we uh, we add once we introduced uh, those kind of uh, people in our in our team just changed the way. Uh, we were developing, and the, the, the speed also at which we were developing by a trim in this factor of time. So it's really important uh, to have those kind of people in your team. Okay. So that's, that is kind of uh, the kind of joke. So when you have a, the when, when you're a developer, that's basically something that would work. But as you can see, not really beautiful. And then that's what happens when you develop something with a, a, full, a full team with, uh, that has their, their own proficiency. Designer, web integrators, and developers working together for better web applications. Thank you.